G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Trina White from Page Two, based in beautiful Vancouver, Canada. Thanks for your time today, Trina. Thanks so much, Troy. Glad to be here. Well, let's start with how we know each other. So that's Faisal on our offshore team reached out and asked if you'd come on the cast. He did. Yeah. Thanks for that. So tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. Yeah. So we are a book publishing company for entrepreneurs and subject matter experts and organizations that want to publish books that are um, that capture their, you know, their IP and their vision for the book and often that are an extension of their brands. So um, we've published books like The Coaching Habit by Michael Bugge Senior, which is a major international bestseller. Alan Dibb, who's a fellow Australian who wrote the One Page Marketing Plan. He runs a, an amazing digital marketing company called SuccessWise. Um, so we work with entrepreneurs and really the whole idea of the company is that we we feel that a book is the ultimate expression of somebody's mastery of their subject Mm -hmm. and the author should be a partner at the table in the book's creation and have have a say in the book's creation so our model is actually quite different from most publishers where we come from what we would describe as the traditional publishing world but we are what you might consider a hybrid publisher where the authors hire us in a fee for service model to produce their book in partnership with them. And it's entrepreneurial for them because they're of course, assuming the financial risk. Yep. And then if the book performs well, they earn more on the back end. All oh, right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I've heard the traditional publishing model is quite brutal for the authors, the, the royalties they get are, you know, bugger all. Yeah, they, they're very low. Our royalties are typically about three times what you would get in a traditional publishing okay. model. Yep. Yeah. And you, I assume you provide a lot of support to help people write those books because I've, I've done a fair bit of writing in the last couple of years, just writing some courses, and it is a, a real skill to be able to do it. I, I still haven't got any, any mastering, but I assume you provide that support to help guide them through getting all that information and knowledge out of their head into the book. We do. In fact, we have an eight week process that we call the build a book process. That is exactly that. It's really digging into who is your target audience for this book? What do you have to say that's unique? And how do we structure this book to to help make it successful? Um, So yeah, of course, it's not something most entrepreneurs have experience with. And we walk them through it in a very guided way. Great. How did you start out? Yeah, well, we started out of adversity, really. My, my business partner, Jesse Finkelstein, and I had been working together in a traditional publishing company and, and had been working in publishing each for about 10 years by the time we launched Page Two. And there were a couple of things that, that pushed us to start a business. One was this recognition that the traditional publishing industry didn't serve subject matter experts and entrepreneurs as well as it could. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw that we, we, we spoke with a number of entrepreneurs who felt frustrated by their traditional publishing experiences and felt that the book was developed in a way that didn't necessarily reflect their brand or wasn't quite in alignment with their broader goals for their business and, and for the book. So we really saw that there was a market for a new way of publishing And at the same time, the company that we were both working for went into uh, creditor protection. So the company folded essentially. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was the publisher, she was the COO and everybody in the company lost their jobs. And we were both suddenly unemployed ourselves and kind of looking into the abyss, wondering what we were going to do next. Yep. And it just seemed like the moment to start our own thing and to develop our own vision for a new way of publishing a book. Right. What year was that? That was in 2013. So we'll yep. be celebrating eight years oh, this year. Right. Congratulations. And Thank how you. old were you when you were kind of forced to make the jump, I guess, into business ownership? 
I was 37 and, and she was also 37. Our birthdays are two days apart. Yep. And, and at the time I was eight months pregnant about, I was supposed to start a maternity leave, but of course that didn't happen. And I then spent that year as with a newborn baby building a business with my new business partner. Wow. Wow. That sounds uh, like a lot of challenges. Do you have any key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business over the eight years? Yeah, you know, I was actually looking back to see what our revenue was in our first full year of business. So oh, in 20 <laughs> Oh, what it was fascinating. So in 2014, our revenue was $100,000 mm. and now we're looking at mid uh, seven figures. Wow. So, you know, right. pretty exponential growth in that time. Yep. And and the 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 big shift in that time was that when we started out, our model was more uh, more of a consulting model. So our authors would hire us to consult on their project, to handle some aspects of project management, but otherwise to connect them with skilled contractors who could design their books or edit their books or you know market the books. So our piece of the picture was very small. So it was the classic trading our time for money. And yep. the switch that we made was we saw we, we can add much more value to the author and earn more if we handle everything from beginning to end and create the seamless experience. They hire us as, a, as an entity to create the entire book for them. So how many years in did you make that switch? That was about two years in, two to three years in. And, and we used to do hourly consultations and things like that. We dropped all of that. And uh, our business model was quite diversified at the beginning. We just completely streamlined and focused on publishing at writ large. Was there any moment that was the catalyst for that decision? Anything that just stood out at the time that made you think we need to change this? You know, there, there was. There was a specific project that we we heard about, um, we had the opportunity to do a project with the embassy of Qatar mm -hmm. in Washington, DC. And as we were pulling our proposal together for this project, we realized that our normal fee structure did not represent the value we would be delivering to this client who wanted a book produced on a rush schedule, all original writing, original photography it was highly complex and there was just nobody who was going to be able to do it and deliver it at the quality that we were able to do. So we realized our fee structure is not, it doesn't actually make sense. We need to rethink this. And, yep. and I would say that was the pivotal moment for That's us right. to make that realization. Yeah, great. What about number of team members? It was yourself and your business partner that started out. And then what number would you be up to now? Yeah, it, it was just the two of us. And now we're at 15 full-time employees and then probably about five additional full-time equivalents in yep. various close contractors that yep, we work right. with on a regular basis. That's that's fantastic. And from 100,000 a year to four to six million roughly uh, in the mids there, that's wonderful growth over eight years, Trina. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. When was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? Yeah, that's an interesting question because there have been different moments along the way. You know, I remember the first time we got a book on a major bestseller list, that external validation meant so much to us. But I think fundamentally for me, it, it's, it was when we started to turn down projects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the first several years, we said yes to everything and we did everything anybody would ever want, whether we publicized that or not is another thing, but we just said yes. Then we got to a point where our reputation grew and we had more business than we could manage and we were able to start turning projects down and really carefully and thoughtfully curating the list of projects that we wanted to work on and that were aligned with our mission and our brand and our interests. What does success look like to you? Yeah, I would say it's, it, there are such different markers. I would say a big part of it for me is it's the reputation that we have. It's um, having an excellent reputation as the leading company in our category, which is where I, I feel we've got now. And it's taken just a tremendously a tremendous amount of work and team building and all kinds of things to get to that point. But it's, it's that recognition. 
And number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business? So for us, marketing has been all about client relationships. Mm -hmm. In fact, our, our marketing of our company has been fairly minimal, to be honest. You know, obviously we have the, the basics around social media and we have an email newsletter and yep. we do interviews like this, but 95% of our business comes to us through referral. Yep. And the reason for that is because we deliver when we work on a project and we work so extraordinarily hard to nurture the relationship with the author, not just while we're working with them, but even afterwards, we're constantly checking in and, you know, trying to maintain lines of communication. So I would say that has been totally key. And we've done some very focused niche marketing efforts. So for instance, um, for us, because we work with thought leaders and speakers and entrepreneurs, we've gone where they tend to go. So there's this private community, for instance, of high profile keynote speakers, and we've sponsored their meetups before and being able to go and network with them in person and again, build relationships with them in person. That kind of marketing for us has been very, very key yeah. but our business is based on it's a boutique kind of business right we're not dealing we're not making our money by volume we're not looking for tons of more customers we we um have a select group that we want to work with so i think that kind of marketing works well for our business model yeah well if 95 percent of your work really is coming through word of mouth referrals that's phenomenal that's just it says a lot about the work you do is that something you measure we, we don't actively measure it, but we, we know because almost every project we sign yeah. immediately tracks back to an yeah. author who made an introduction or a friend of an author we know who made an introduction. Do you have any other measurements that you track in the business for like customer satisfaction or? You know, we don't, Troy. And I think it is something that we'll be looking at in the, in the, coming years, we're now really focusing on the customer experience. We think we can do an even better job. So that measurement is going to become important to it, but we haven't yet. Yeah. In my email too, I think I included a link through the, to the Net Promoter School, which I'd encourage you to have a look at. It's one question, really powerful, really simple. I think it was McKinsey and co that just mm -hmm. developed it in the nineties. It's yeah, I use it in a few of the businesses that uh, I sit on boards of and yeah, mm -hmm. we find it really powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How did you fund your business? We completely bootstrapped it. So after we lost our jobs in that bankruptcy, we were on employment insurance, earning probably $24,000 a year for that first year. Yep. And I ended up taking on editing contracts because I had been an editor in, in my previous life. So we actually, I, I was out doing freelance contracts and then we put the, the money from that into building the business. Um, but because it's, it's a service-based business, the, the startup cost was really more about building a website and so on. So, so book publishing is capital intensive in that there are printing costs and you, know, you have to pay for the labor and the design and all of that stuff. But, but in our model, the, the capital required to start it up was quite minimal, which is one, another reason that we chose this business model versus a very traditional publishing model. Yeah. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Absolutely. And really, that's just because it's my pa books are my passion. It's an industry I've worked in now for 15 years. And I live and breathe book publishing. And so, yeah, absolutely. Can you I, would I recommend other people go into it? <laughs> Probably not because yeah. it's a notoriously risky industry. Yeah. So, you know, bankruptcies are extremely common. And right. uh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't recommend it to other people necessarily. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Yeah, you know, you probably are hearing this from a lot of people these days, but by far the most stressful point was the onset of covid and for us, the reason for that particular stress was that uh, many of our authors are speakers and their business literally dried up overnight. We, we have one author who called me in early March and he said, Trina, I've just lost a million dollars in speaking contracts in the last week. 
and I don't know what I'm doing. So we had this early sign from what was happening to the speakers with their events that trouble was on the horizon. And we started to lose some contracts as a direct result of that. So it was just this very precarious time where we were quite concerned about cash flow. We've always been very careful to, to have a cushion and a contingency fund, but at, at the end of March, that's also when we need to pay our authors um, for all of their sales. We had a big tax installment coming. So suddenly for the first time, cash flow was extremely, um, just felt extremely precarious. Yeah. So I guess in terms of the lessons that I would take from that, what I think what saved us is that not all of our authors were from the speaking community. It was the diversity of our list and um, kind of the, you know, our, the diversity of our client business, because had they all been primarily making their their living through speaking we would have been in serious trouble at that time yeah right out of interest i assume a lot of the books are also put into audiobooks as well do you find many do do you find many of the authors narrate their own book or you've you've got voice over experts that do that we do have voice talent and we do bring them in but most of our authors do their own audiobook recording yeah and we we manage all of that for them yeah, yeah, right. And what, what's roughly the mix that you've seen between the traditional printed book to the audio book out of interest? Yeah, so the mix that we're seeing right now is typically about 75% book sales are print, right? about 5% audiobook, and then about 20% ebook. Okay. And we, we have had some authors like uh, an author named Phil Jones, who wrote a book called Exactly What to Say, <clears throat> who's a sales trainer his audiobooks have far exceeded that percentage breakdown beyond yep. any expectation. And I think part, partly that's because he is a speaker and people yes. are used to hearing his material in that way. Yeah. Um, but for, for the most part, that's the mix. I'm really surprised with that. Only 5% are audiobooks. I just, because I consume most, or well, ne- nearly all the books I read or I listen to, except the ones you can't get on, on Audible. So, yeah, that's really low in. It, it's low and it's also the fastest growing area of publishing. So yeah. we're seeing double digit growth in audiobook sales year by year, whereas the other formats have mostly plateaued. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? I would say sales and marketing. It's, it's you know, for, for, authors, I would say those are always the big challenges. No author ever feels that their book reached its fullest potential on the sales and marketing front. So we're constantly looking at new ways to sell books and to market books. We're constantly um, just making sure we're at the cutting edge of what's possible and that we're serving them in the fullest way possible. So for instance, in January, we announced a new sales Uh, sales agreement that sales and distribution agreement that we have with Macmillan which is one of the big multinational publishers so they're now selling and distributing our books globally um, uh, which is you know a a great shift and then building our audiobook program thinking about bulk sales and how to support our authors to sell their books direct to their own clients these are these are all things that we've developed over the last couple of years in an effort to make sure that the sales and marketing is as rich and you know adding as much value as possible yeah that would be really important and i think from memory like the new york times bestseller but getting on that list is quite an important thing particularly for a book launch and that's something that you guys, uh, I guess, market towards for the launch. Is that that's something that's really important for for the authors? It's it's I I wouldn't I don't know that I'd say it's really important. It's an amazing and wonderful thing when it happens, but it's really hard to get those spots. <laughs> you you have to sell. 10,000 copies of your book in one week to get on the New York Times bestseller list. So yes, we definitely work on bulk sales strategies and other strategies that can help get there. But um, yeah, sorry, I thought the number was like 20,000 books in the first week, but 10,000 is even lower. I'm really surprised at that number. Yeah, at least, probably at least 10,000 copies. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. right, yeah. What have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? It's, it's all the systems development, processes, 
documenting processes, op- operations, basically. Yep. Um, I, I think like most entrepreneurs, I don't have a head for that. I have zero interest in it. It's not my strength. So one of the things that we've done is we've actually our very first full-time employee and a, a wonderful woman named Gabby, um, she's now our director of operations just as of last fall. And she is just doing the most amazing things that would never in a million years have occurred to me that are making the whole company run so much more efficiently and effectively. And so for us, the solution was putting the right person in place who yep. did have that kind of brain. She's wired that way and also passionate about it, I guess. She is. Yeah. What do you love most about growing a small business? Well, I would say I'm somebody who loves change and stimulation and that is what this experience has been over the last eight years. Every day really is different. And we are constantly coming up with new services and, you know, facing new challenges. And so it's the constant problem solving and rolling out programs that I love. What has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? I'd say it's been from moving from somebody who worked primarily independently or as part of a team to somebody who's leading a team with my co-founder. So before launching page two, I didn't have a ton of leadership experience. I I had, you know, led a small team of about five people for a year. And and that was really the extent of it. So I've been learning leadership skills along the way. And that's been a massive mindset shift that it's, it's all about them and elevating them and empowering them and not really about me. Yeah. What is the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? I would say prioritizing. So the, the question that's constantly going through my mind now is, is this something I uniquely can do or can somebody else do it well at the company? And nope. if somebody else can do it, then it needs to come off my plate. Yep. So yeah, totally critical. I love that saying, if everything is a priority, nothing is. Yeah, that's right. Do you love talking small business growth with other owners? We have a vibrant online community from many industries around the world. Plus, we regularly add new tools and resources for community members and host two webinars a month to help you grow your small business. GrowSmallBusiness.com. Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Yeah, you know, for the most part, what we've done is we've started by bringing people on a, on a contract basis or even a freelance basis. And that's worked really well for us. So um, all, virtually everybody on our team at one point w- was a contractor. And then eventually we rolled them over into full-time employees And that was helpful because we could really assess whether there was a cultural fit, whether they had the aptitude, the mindset, and so on to thrive at page two. Um, That that has been really key to us. I would say in terms of mistakes, the, the biggest mistake has been needing to fill a position and moving too quickly to do that. So I think we I've heard it's called the warm, warm body syndrome. The warm body syndrome. Yep. Yeah. You just need a warm body in that seat and let's keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for the most part, we've avoided that, but I'm thinking of one specific situation where we had a contractor and I think we knew it wasn't working out. Yep. This person was, was not the right fit. And yet we hired her full time anyway, because we needed somebody in that role. And it just felt too daunting to start from scratch with somebody new and then ultimately we had to lay this person off a couple of years later. Yep. So we wouldn't make that mistake again. We would be faster to make those difficult decisions. What are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Yeah, for, for us, the key has been working with the team to develop their own role. Because every time we hire somebody, or every, you know, over the last eight, eight years, every time we've hired somebody, for the most part, it's been a new position that has never existed before at the company. We've just identified that there's a gap. And so we have an idea of what the role will be, but we, we hire for 
attitude and aptitude and motivation and all of those things first and foremost kind yeah. of the good to great idea that you get the right people on the bus yes. and then you figure out what they do yeah. we absolutely subscribe to that mm -hmm. and so we work with our team to shape their roles once they're in them so you know what's working for you what isn't working for you what are the pain points and it, it ends up creating this culture where people really feel ownership over their jobs. They're super excited to be there because they're doing the work that they're meant to be doing. And they're playing and, to their strengths. Yeah. And they're playing to their strengths. Mm, that's great. Great philosophy. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. So I'm probably the worst person you could ask this <laughs> question of because yep. I've been done a crap job of handling <laughs> balance for eight years, especially since I started the company with a newborn in hand. Yep. Um, balance has never existed for me. And I, I actually crashed, to be totally honest, last fall after having both of my sons home all year. Mm. The schools were out in Canada because of the pandemic and all the stresses of running a small business through the pandemic. I basically had what I would call a, a breakdown yep. and realized that I could not continue like this. And it's it's led to some pretty fundamental changes to how I think about balance yep. um, and now for instance I almost never work on the weekends and I did every weekend before I almost never work in the evenings I've changed my perspective about the chaos that will have you know that will come if I don't work in the evenings yep. and weekends and, and I've just had to create these boundaries and and I'm also exercising consistently about six days a week as right. a matter of priority every single morning. Yeah. And that's been utterly critical to that feeling of balance. Yeah, I think it's a double-edged sword with being a business owner because we love what we do and it's quite passionate about it, but we could just work seven days a week. But clearly we needed that break uh mentally and physically to get out and do other things and it, that actually feeds back into the value of your business by you being happier and, and more uh, attentive to what you're working on that's exactly right i i realize now that i'm not necessarily serving anyone that well if i'm exhausted and burnt out yeah exactly yeah, yeah. how much professional development have you invested in yourself over the years courses training conferences events and books podcast you know, well you know so books obviously because ah. I work in books I would say to to be totally true much of my professional development has come from our authors right. and it's because the kinds of books that we publish are typically in the business and leadership categories and in the self-help categories so we've published a number of excellent books on marketing leadership managing a small business mindfulness and, and so that has been where I really learned and developed and, um, and, and through conversations with our authors too, many of whom are serious experts in the, in the leadership space, for instance, and quite generous with their feedback and input. Great. Yeah. What about mentors or coaches along the way? Yeah. So I would say, honestly, one of my, my biggest mentors has been my co-founder, and obviously we're partners, but I also do think of her as a mentor. Um, she's, I've just learned so much from her over the last eight years. More recently, we've been working with somebody named Neen James, who is a, a kind of a business coach and mentor. And she's been helping us think through all kinds of things around pricing, branding, or offering, um, you know, strategic planning. And, and that's been really an amazing experience. I think next, I would probably like to invest in a coach, mm -hmm. a, a, a longer term, you know, executive coach. Yep. I think that would be really beneficial. Great. The, sorry, the coach at the moment, how often do you catch up with her? Yeah, that's about once every, once a month or so. Right. Yep. Yeah, right. She's really digging into our business strategy with us. Yeah, it's good to have someone outside the forest looking, you know, you're in there looking looking for trees and just to ask esoteric questions or different angles of things. And even the simple question that's come up last night at the meetup, it's like, why are you even doing that? You've just told me all this pain in this corner of the business and you're not making any money. So why, why are you still doing it, you know? 
Yeah, it's so helpful to have that questioning mind, question yeah. your assumptions. Do you have a board of directors or advisors? You know, we when we launched, we did set up an advisory board of about five or six different executives from very different fields. Actually, yep. nobody from our industry, but from marketing and other fields. That kind of fizzled out after a couple of years. And um, now we don't have a formal advisory board. Mm -hmm. we, we're constantly consulting with people, though, in a much more informal way. Yep. And that that's... I think that's been more helpful to us because we can get feedback on the fly and be responsive to changes in the business. Yeah. All right, Trina, on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? It's about that question of balance, to keeping your energy up and not grinding yourself down. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most. You, you must be the expert on this one. You know, it's it's one of ours. It's The Coaching Habit by Michael bungay Stainer, which is seven coaching questions anyone can use in their day to help your team be more effective and get to the heart of the, the issue. Great. I'm adding that one to my list right now. It's brilliant. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? <laughs> yeah, I do really like a few podcasts. Um, Mike McCallowitz has a great one called Mike Up in Your Business for Small Business Owners. Is he the guy who started WordPress? He's not. He oh. He's the author of Profit First. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. The, yeah. Yeah. What Start This Next. He has a whole series of business books for small business owners. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and an excellent podcast. Um, I, I also really like a podcast called Power, Presence and Position by a woman named Eleanor Beaton, mm -hmm. which is specifically for women entrepreneurs. And it just has this fiery kind of inspirational energy and she's wickedly smart. Great. We'll, we'll link through to those in the show notes. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Oh, I would say one tool would be just get yourself set up on proper tools at the beginning, yep. QuickBooks online, Google suite, you know, whatever it is, just set yourself up for success early on because changing the tools later is oh, a nightmare. Painful, isn't it? And which I love, we, we've done. I love G Suite. It's so, so good, uh, which is the Google platform. Yeah. Same. Final, my favorite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? I would say have fun. This is the, other than parenting, this will be the biggest learning experience of your life and enjoy it for what it is. Great. Well, thanks for your time today, Trina. I think the audience get a shit ton of value out of what you shared with us and congratulations on the growth. That's phenomenal in eight years from two to around 20 FTE now and a hundred grand to the mid seven figures. So well done. That's a really good achievement. Thanks so much, Troy. Thanks for having me too. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.